The second meeting of the 23rd Council will please come to order. All Council members are present this evening. At this time, we will have a moment of silence. And during the moment of silence, I would like to keep in our thoughts Jordan Casey Marquez and Francisco Paco Fernandez, the victims of the Aztec shooting. And followed by the moment of silence, we will have the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by our, by our new city councilor, Councilor Borrego. Thank you, Councillor Borrego. Uh, Civic Plaza parking passes are provided for members of the public. You can obtain a parking pass from Council staff at the sign-up table. And uh, tonight's meeting and proceedings, we are asking that each of you, after somebody speaks, uh, to not applaud or make any applause or outburst. Uh, please keep these meetings as civil as possible and respect one another during these proceedings. Uh, there, are, there are other rules, but I think we are all pretty familiar with the rules. At this time, we are going to invite up, there will be a presentation from Lurley No and the Sunshine Ambassadors. Would you please come up? Okay, we'll go ahead and defer that. She's gonna be coming in shortly? Okay, we'll defer that for now. Uh, next, we have a presentation and Councilor Pena. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I apologize, I didn't have my script in front of me. But we have a presentation, The opi Opiate e Epidemic in New Mexico by Pia Salazar and Sullivan Jezanowski and Matthew um, Vincent from Fer, I, you know I can't say the name of that, <laughs> that firm, and Washboro, Drew, and Drew Setter. Good evening. I'm Pia Salazar. I'm here to talk to you today about the opioid epidemic in Albuquerque and encourage, basically the, the purpose is basically to encourage the city to pursue litigation against the manufacturers and distributors of the op opioid products. Um, just, just real briefly, um, opioids are painkillers. Um, they're they were once viewed as being highly addictive, and then over time there was a campaign by the manufacturers and the distributors to make them appear less um, addictive. Um, rather than being viewed uh, as dangerous, they were now viewed as being safe for long-term use. Um, what the manufacturers were promoting to the doctors and the pharmacies basically saying that the rate of addiction was much lower than anticipated and again that it was safe for long-term use um, they were saying it was only one percent of patient population would be addicted after about a year's time when in fact the numbers were far greater that after you know for example the reality was after 30 days of a prescription of opioid painkillers, the rate of addiction could be up to 35% for one year. And even after a 10-day dose, prescription dose, there's a um, rate of addiction that is estimated to be up to 20%. One of the things that makes it so addictive, makes these painkillers so addictive, is that their chemical makeup is very similar to heroin. And it you know, plays on the receptors of the brain and um, you know, can fuel this, the, the addiction rate. As such, the, the rate of addiction and of this epidemic has skyrocketed. And when they totaled the deaths, the overdose, overdose deaths in 2016 on, based on opioids, the number of deaths was actually greater than, you know, the deaths associated with the Vietnam War, car crashes, HIV death, and gun deaths all put together. Um, how did this all happen? 
1996, that's when Purdue Pharma introduced OxyContin. And the drug overdose deaths from that point on, from 1996 onward, has just skyrocketed in the United States. In fact, it's now become the leading cause of death um, in Americans under the age of 55. You know, as all the other types of deaths are you know, coming down or, or going up at a slighter, higher, slight, uh, um, smaller rate, the, de the deaths associated with opioid deaths is much greater. So, um, in fact, in the United States, it's such a, a huge epidemic in our country that our life expectancy is going down, whereas all the other first world country life expectancies are actually rising. Um, this slide, this is one that always strikes me. Um, the, that very first column is the, is the United States overdose consumption, I'm sorry, OxyContin content consumption in 2015, and that's compared to all of the other first world countries. You know, the blue shows the consumption of the other countries, and ours is the one on the left-hand um, corner. So who's to blame for this? Um, we are looking at um, filing suit against drug manufacturers and the distributors. The drug manufacturers are the companies that you may or may not be familiar with, Purdue, Endo, Al Allergen, and basically for um, promoting um, misinformation related to opioids for financial gain. And how did they do this? Um, quickly, they essentially told physicians that it was unethical not to completely um, cover people that are in, you know, suffering from great amount of pain. And they came up with this um, fifth vital sign that had the patients basically tell the provider how much pain they were in, and it was a very subjective type of scale. Um, they, you know, they went before Congress and said that the addiction rate is extremely rare. Um, as a result of this, a lot of these uh, manufacturers were fined you know, millions and millions of dollars, but it didn't have very much effect because their profit rate is so high that they, um, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't curbed the misuse and mis, um, of these opioids. Manufacturers aren't the only ones to blame. Um, in addition, there's distributors and, um, and some drug stores that are at fault. You know, in 1970, the Congress enacted the Controlled Substance Act. And what they did is they allowed three manufacturers to distribute these opioids, such as OxyContin, be, um, because they recognized that there was such a uh, potential for abuse. So rather than um, have a lot of distributors, they gave it to three people. And the one duty that they had was to report any suspicious use to the government. It didn't happen. And instead, the consumption and the misuse kept going. So the reason we're, I'm here today, I'm, you know, I'm a local law firm. I'm you know, born and raised in Albuquerque. And we do this type of work. We um, file actions on behalf of plaintiffs. And I, we've teamed up with two <coughs> Texas firms. They're two of a handful of firms in the United States that are you know, actually qualified to be doing these uh, multi-complex litigation. And what we would like is just encouraging the city to take action on this behalf. Our, you know, our city has suffered tremendously as, um, as a result of the opioid addiction rate. And we'd like the city to take action, whether um, through an RFP or hiring somebody, it doesn't matter. You know, we just want you to hire somebody that's good and to move forward with this because all the other states in the country are doing so. And we'd like New Mexico to be one of, you know, in there and well represented. Um, I know we're short on time, so I don't know if you have any questions, but one of the um, benefits, I think, to hiring a firm and doing, you know, either through contract or through an RFP is that you can do a very um, specialized damage model. And our city has, as you know, suffered tremendous losses financially through uh, the police force, you know, due to um, the hospital, UNMH, or the, um, 
the ambulance costs of transporting people that have been overdosed. So there's, I mean, it goes on and on. And part of hiring a lawyer is to help develop a very effective damage model on your behalf. So that's, that's why we're here. We want to kind of give you an overview about what the problem is and encourage you to move forward and um, make sure that the city of Albuquerque is well represented in this opioid litigation. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Are there any questions from council? Councilor Pena and then Councilor Davis. Well, I just want to thank you for your presentation, Pia. It, it, unfortunately, I think you've probably visited with several other, other counselors, um, but I wish we had an opportunity to show your entire presentation, really, because this is something that, you know, we have an epidemic in the state of New Mexico and something absolutely needs to be done. You know, we're losing friends, family members to this drug that was actually um, forced on us by, by the pharmaceutical um, um, companies and I, I really appreciate your efforts. I know that the county has already actually moved forward in terms of presenting something um, in terms of legislation. I'm hoping that here at the city we can we can do the same thing. You know, I, I know um, you're the firm that has has come before us, but I don't, I'm not sure how we work all that out. But I think sure. that it's important that we do something because if not, um, we're going to continue on this upward spiral of just losing our our young kids especially because, you know, they get hooked on this. There's a lot of kids that, you know, I've heard and I know of kids who have been in sports and they get injured and, you know, the doctor prescribes this medication for them and, and then before you know it, um, they're hooked on, on prescription pills and then after a while, as you know, it turns into, into heroin. So I'm hoping that we can do something to address this. So yeah. thank you. You're welcome, and you make a very good point because that is one of the models of how the addiction starts off is that somebody will have just a, you know, a, a car accident injury or a sports injury and they get too much of the opioids or maybe it's not the appropriate um, painkiller and they end up becoming quickly ad addicted and then it's you know, taken away from them and many people that you would um, you know, turn to heroin to, because of the addiction rate beca and because they're so close in composition. And so yes, no, whatever the city decides, um, I think it's just very important that we act and we do do something for the city and whether, like I said, if it's not our firm, if it's somebody, we just think that it's very important for the city to do something and try to, you know, end this, this process, of, process of addiction and um, hopefully recover back some of our losses and then to be able to educate future generations and you know, sort of like the tobacco litigation and see if we can put an end to this in our community. And just to end to that, that just correlates with our uptick in, in you know, the homelessness and Absolutely. the behavioral health issues that we have. So all those things have to be addressed simultaneously. Well, and it has an impact in so many crime. ways, our increased mm -hmm. crime rate, exactly. You're exactly right. Councilor Davis. Thank you, Mr. President, and I appreciate that very much, Councilor Pena, you're right, and I think we ought to take a look at uh, the proper venue for this. Um, I, you know, I suspect we ought to work with the administration to see if there's uh, a process by which we could help craft the legislation to require an RFP so that firms who have this expertise can present us with some strategies to do it. I think it is important, and looking at the tobacco settlement is a good example of how um, ultimately it was cities and counties and states who stood up uh, joining together uh, to fight this uh, to get the data and the public health interest out front because we are cleaning up those differences. I will recall from this council last year when we passed our uh, uh, down and out regulations for the fire department and looking at the data, 41,000 times in the city uh, last year, uh, police officers, two police officers, a fire unit, a rescue unit, an Albuquerque ambulance went to a down and out call for someone who was passed out in a public place. Half of them were about alcohol, but the other half were addiction services. Um, and when we extrapolate that out at you know $500 per call for service for just 15 minutes of being on the street, that was more than $10 million in taxpayer dollars that we spent just on responding um, to that without the transfer cost to the hospital. It, it impacts our community, it impacts uh, our uh, property crime epidemic, um, and we have to have some help on the prevention side. And clearly so far the corporations um, have done very little to nothing. Um, to help us in that fight, and they're passing their corporate responsibility down to us. And so I do think it's up to us to take a look at those options on a preventive long term. So I appreciate the folks for bringing this to our attention, and I would look forward to working with you in the administration to decide if that's a strategy we could do. Thanks. Councillor Gibson. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'd also like to offer my thanks for uh, you coming in and giving this presentation. Um, I did meet with someone, I don't recall if he was from your firm or not. This it is a few weeks ago. It was, yes, it was. I wasn't there, oh, but. Oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah. I, um, and I absolutely <clears throat> agree that, you know, there is a, a strong uh, uh, corollary to be made um, uh, fight, fighting against the uh, pharmaceuticals on this uh, topic of, of opioids and uh, the uh, uh, tobacco uh, thing. So, um, and unfortunately, it all comes down to money. As they can keep paying these fines, millions and millions and millions of dollars, and it's still worth it to them to keep producing. So it's, you know, and by the way, before I forget, there's an excellent book that I'd like to recommend to anybody who's interested. Uh, it is called Dreamland, exactly. Dreamland by Sam Quinones. Uh, and it gives, he gives such a good um, history of how we got into this mess. Exactly. It provides uh, starting, a great timeline. Yeah, starting in maybe the early 90s, I think and how heroin changed and um, uh, the, the uh, advent of, um, of, of uh, opioids such as oxycontin and oxycodone. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great book, very readable, big thick book, but it's, it's really a page turner. And um, another, <laughs> another good resource, I don't know if you saw the 60 Minutes presentation on the epidemic um, throughout the nation. That, is also a really good one, and you know the DEA lawyer who is you know interviewed in that is actually working with our team because he was so fed up on the lack of um, enforcement mm -hmm. that um, uh, you know he he decided to try to be on the other end to try to actually get the you know get these manufacturers and um, distributors to be more responsible and to fulfill their duty under the Controlled Substances Act. Right. So, but that's another really good resource along with Dreamland if you uh, need some background. That. Okay, the last thing I want to say is that I've been in a number of conversations about this topic, about addiction, and the devastating effects that it's had um, uh, wherever you live in the United States and maybe even globally, I, I'm not sure about that. But the one thing that comes up the least is um, treatment. And we can't just keep ignoring that. We need to invest in treatment programs. Uh, I really believe it's at every level of government. It's not easy and it's not cheap, but we cannot keep letting people kill themselves. And that's what's happening. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Gibson. Councilor Borrego, then Councilor Harris. Thank you, Pia, for being here this evening. So um, I remember my father, who fought in World War II, used to tell us when we were kids that, you know, the way that this country would be taken over was through drugs. And what I've seen in our community is kind of a public health crisis. Absolutely. And I think that uh, addiction um, crosses all uh, economic levels. Um, and, you know, if anyone has ever had experience, and I have, by the way, first-hand experience trying to get people to um, some sort of treatment, the treatment is not always available. Um, and I think that um, it's really important that we, even if it's one person at a time, start learning how to fight back. Um, the public uh, treatment that is available is limited. And I think that we as a council need to look, um, and as a community need to look into those issues in the future. I fully intend to do that. Um, I grew up in a small town, as everybody knows, and um, <laughs> supposedly the worst in the country, which I'm not sure that I totally agree with. But um, I think that we, at some point, need to recognize that these issues are issues that affect all of our families and uh, friends as our counselor said they're not only young people's issues, they're older people. Um, I know that you know doctors prescribe these types of opioids on a regular basis. 
And if people are not um, sort of weaned off of them after they have surgery, sometimes they can easily become addicted, and oftentimes they're elderly as well. So I just wanted to point that, that out as well. Right, you make a number of really, really good points. And you know, in, in many ways, the, the physicians were, you know, I guess re-educated by, you know, a lot of these, and we know now false studies that were coming out saying that these really were safer for long-term use. And so, but it all came, you know, further back, not so much the physicians, but the manufacturers and the distributors. And then to your point about, um, you know, you, you being very familiar with this topic, I mean, we've made this presentation to a number of, you know, municipalities, counties, cities, tribes, and there's not one time that we've talk to people about this that um, they don't say that they're very familiar or they know somebody very close to them that has had a problem well, with this. Well, in Albuquerque being the big city in the state, uh, we set the example for the smaller cities and smaller <coughs> counties, so I think this is a very important issue, and I thank you for being here this evening. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Councillor Harris, then we have one follow-up question by Councillor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Ms. Salazar. Just a couple questions. I want to be clear. First of all, um, I think you're suggesting a legal services contract, and I'm guessing that you understand, or like everyone knows by now, that we have a big budget deficit. So are you thinking that something like this could actually be on a contingency fee basis for a city? Absolutely. And, and that's, that's how we would propose doing it, um, on a contingency basis where, where the firm that's representing the city would do, would front all the costs, um, you know, and do the entire litigation and get paid when, and you know, if and when uh, there is um, some sort of resolution, whether it's a jury trial or a settlement or something like that. But no, we do, I mean, we're very familiar with the, with the budget problems in our state. So no, that, that's what we think makes the most sense. And that's why, and I've actually, you know, teamed up with these two uh, law firms because there's only a handful of litigants that do this type of work that have one, you know, the financial resources to fund something so large against, you know, big pharma and, um, and then actually have the experience in, um, in this type of litigation. Okay. So no, yeah. absolutely. And it would be sure. the way we do it. I'm just saying yeah. is that it would be a kind of the more you get the less of the contingency. And so oh, anyway, people sense. people do things differently. That's you know, and, uh, and and yeah, thank you for that. And the other thing, I'm guessing that um, well, first of all, uh, getting back to that, uh, you have provided, I'm guessing, or will provide to U.S. to the city attorney rather uh, examples of of the fee contract. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Right. And finally, I think that. Uh, any kind of legislation, someone mentioned that the Burnley County might have provided legislation, but I think that we'd probably be preempted from actually legislating in this area regarding medicine, right? The city of Albuquerque probably can't. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know that I understand your question. Uh, the city of Albuquerque, in terms of our legislative power, oh, yes. mm -hmm. um, to like get involved in issues of what kind of medication should or shouldn't be prescribed, I'm, I'm guessing that we can't go near that I'm both in st state and federal are probably preempted because it's it's a controlled substance that would fall under the controlled Stu substances act so I mean there may be some things that the city could do but if I'm understanding your question correctly probably not um, now there the pharmacy board for example the state pharmacy board is doing things it's my understanding to try to help identify abuses which is what you know those distributors should have been doing all this time and um, so I think there's more, um, and I don't know, again, that this okay. is what the city does, but, you know, um, there's things that they can do that, you know, where more red flags will come up if there seems to be an increase in prescription rate, for example, um, compared to a population rate, you know, that kind of thing. Suspicious use. So I think our, um, the pharmacy board is trying to, you know, better do things, but I, it's not something that I believe the city has the power to do. Okay, thank you. That's what I thought. Okay. Councillor Peña. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I'll, I'll just end it with just saying again, thank you for being here. And, and to ask you if you could actually just put up the, the one slide that you have, the oxycodone consumption, consumption in 2015. And the only reason I say that is just because if you look at this, when you put it up earlier, obviously you didn't have time to do the entire presentation. It's really, um, I think it's really a powerful presentation in terms of what's happening in our community today. But, um, if you can't, it's okay. I'm sorry, you already closed it up. I just wanted to say that, you know, you looked at it when you glanced through it a minute ago, it showed, you know, it has Canada, Germany, Australia, and if you look at, at the United States, it's just off the charts in terms of consumption. So I don't know what the answer is, but I think this is a good attempt at trying to address it. So thank you, I appreciate you being here. You're very welcome, and I think she's, can you, do you think? That's fine, I think we, you think you've got it? We yeah. think we've got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you so appreciate much for your time. time. And presentation. Yeah. Appreciate uh, allowing Thank you. the presentation. You're welcome. Okay, let's go back to uh, Lurley No and the Sunshine Ambassadors. I think they are all here now. <laughs> Ms. No? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and talk while, while we get the, our dancers uh, set up. And I wanted to introduce the Sunshine Ambassadors. We are a dance program for children and adults with disabilities. We are 501c3 that was started over 12 years ago in the state of Tennessee. And then uh, the Great Recession hit, our family had to move, and we ended up here. So we have brought sunshine, more sunshine here to this wonderful Sunshine State. And uh, our mission in this program is to enrich the lives of children and adults with disabilities, as well as to advocate for those that have disabilities. We do this through weekly classes and public performances such as this, so that you can see that uh, people with disabilities often have more abilities than you give them credit to initially. And so um, our whole idea is to emphasize progression for the individual, not perfection. And so some of our dancers need a little help. So we have some, uh, we have peer dancers that, di that uh, dance with us as well as uh, using adult volunteers and, and teen volunteers as well. Uh, we just started our second class in Albuquerque, which is going to be at the St. Jude Thaddeus Catholic Church on the west side. And so, and this class is at the, OS let's see, it's at 3805 Academy Parkway with uh, Dance Theater Southwest. So if you need infor more information, we do have flyers that are located out at the table, and I believe that all the council members have received a flyer as well about our program. We're very proud of our program. We have reached and affected the lives of many, many people, including some that have actually been in film and other dance programs as well. I'm going to stop talking and let you see one of, our, one of our dances and just ring in the holiday season with a little bit of Jingle Bell Rocks. So just bear with me as I get the music going.
very much. Great job, Sunshine Ambassadors. Let's go ahead and go on to the next item. Uh, it will be presentation from Gerald Romero, the budget officer, regarding the latest GRT projections and report. Welcome, Mr. Romero. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. I'm Gerald Romero, budget officer for the city. Um, on December 15th, Friday, we received our October um, distribution. This is October activity that is accrued for November, so I apologize. So this would include um, the balloon fiesta. So we, uh, the year over, year over year, so this would be November compared to November a year ago, we're up 17.7%. As we expected, if you'll recall, we were down substantially looking at October of 17 compared to October one year before that because of a very um, anomalous distribution and then a correction made a year ago. So we're trending right now at 0.9%. Um, once again, our original budget estimate for gross receipts tax distribution growth was 3%. And right now in our five-year forecast, which is on the letter of introduction, um, we're looking at revising that 3% projection down to 1.7. So um, it's positive. It's um, not bad news, but uh, we, we certainly could be growing at, at a higher rate. Um, construction seemed to be driving by, lar by far the largest source of growth uh, for the month for November. So I stand for questions. Are there any questions? Councilor Harris. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Romero. And uh, just to clarify something, I talked to a member of the executive staff over here, and some people have wondered uh, about what appeared, um, if you read the uh, journal article a certain way today, that the mayor was going to be doing some sort of presentation about the, the budget and the, the forecast. But I uh, understand that really what the mayor meant is that he's just going to be answering questions. So there are some people who came here today w wanting that presentation about the the, uh, the budget and the, and the forecast, but I guess that's not really forthcoming at this point. Is that, is that correct? Uh, Mr. President and Councillor Harris, I, I was not expecting to make a presentation on the five-year forecast since it was just on the letter of introduction. I'm happy to do that at Finance and Gover Government Operation Committee's uh, first meeting of January, if you'd like, or make a full presentation to the Council um, sometime in January. But. I was not prepared to do that tonight. Oh, yeah, I understand. I just wanted to clarify for people who might be watching, wondering, because I was actually wondering if that was going to happen today and was watching the ABQ Journal and wanting to see what he had to say. But um, I guess they're just answering questions. I just want uh, that clarification. Thanks. Just work that out with the president. Thanks. Are there any other questions for Mr. Romero? Let's see. Yeah. Councilor Gibson, Councilor Davis. Santa Claus. <laughs> Doom and gloom, I think. <laughs> Well, so that's what I want to ask you because I, I, I'm, I'm still not clear. I'm sorry. So last month, that was um, uh, they reported back to us. Was that twelve down twelve percent? Correct. Okay. And, and the latest one for again, this is from October one to October thirty first, or s some major part of October. And then now we're up to seventeen. Correct. So, wow. Mr. President and, and Councillor Gibson, um, remember we're looking at growth rates for the same month a year ago, and in October of 16, we got a very large distribution that was a mistake. The state turned around and fixed it in November of 16. So you had a huge fluctuation up, and then a huge fluctuation down from October to November of 16. So even though we're looking at more normal trends now, you're, you're looking at those very odd bases one year ago. So yeah. it looks like a very um, ne large negative number last month and then a large positive number this month when really the trend is, is what matters now. Um, so that's the year over year for the month. Correct. We, we do gotcha. that because there's seasonality. If we looked at, um, October compared to the next following month, November, 
you've got things like you know, retail sales, you've got um, the balloon fiesta. We try to sort of wash that out and look at the seasonality by comparing October to October a year ago. Okay. So, so far from July 1st to, to well, at least beginning of no November, well, our growth is at just a little, a little under 1% and we're working on 3% for the year. Councilor Sanchez and, and Councilor Gibson, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Councilor Davis. Very briefly, Mr. Romero, thank you. Uh, in the mayor's press conference earlier today, I think we went through the numbers a little bit, but essentially what this means for us, if we stay on this projection for the rest of the year, is we have about a $5.6 million, sort of maybe a call, I hate this word, but a structural deficit in our budget. But if I recall, uh, we entered the year with a little bigger expectation for that and some of the austerity measures and delaying some hiring. Um, and also just some delayed onboarding for programs has helped us keep on track. And I think I heard the mayor say and, son and uh, our new CFO say, um, we can absorb a 5.6. We dealt with a $10 million last year. We're on track and doing okay in that regard in, in terms of um, not, at this point, the budget office hasn't made any recommendations for any structural changes to the budget. Is that correct for this year? Mr. President and Councilor Davis, yes. And it, right now um, it's, it's mostly driven by the revenue. It is driven by yep. the revenue loss, right? So we, we ended 17 with revenues a little lower than expected, but because of the, some of the austerity measures we put in place about January of last year, we didn't spend all of the department's appropriations. So we carry forward a little bit more to help us out. Um, that said, if departments fully spend their budgets this year that they were appropriated, we still have about a $5.9 million revenue shortfall that we need to deal with. We know about it well enough in advance. It, it's not insurmountable. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. I have one question, Mr. Romero, and my question is in regards to a letter that was sent over a year ago by Councillor Benton in reference to the distribution of the gross receipts taxes and the methodology that was being utilized. Have we gotten word back from Tax and Rev regarding that issue? Mr. President, I'm looking at the city economist and he's nodding his head no. I think we need to probably follow up as quickly as possible and we need a response back uh, from the state regarding that issue. Mr. President, I'll, I'll work with council staff to follow up on that. Councilor Benton. Thanks for bringing that up, Mr. President. Um, Mr. Romero, um, you mentioned the uh, department spending, you know, the scenario is that they're going to spend their budget. In, in very rough numbers and across the board, do you know how, what the average in reversions has been over the last, you know, two or three years? Um, Mr. President and Councillor Benton, I would say um, about 2% of the overall general fund appropriation would be an average um, anywhere between 8 and 12 million over the last three years per year. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Councillor Benton. Uh, let's go and move on uh, to item number four, economic development discussions. There is none this evening. Uh, we are now under item five, administrative question and answers. Uh, are there any questions for the administration? Councillor Davis. I promise I don't have something for everything on the agenda tonight. Uh, thanks, and for the administration, uh, I think Mr. Real, but we heard last week uh, from the mayor at one of his presentations that uh, as the new administration was looking through the budget, um, they were taking a look obviously at ART funding um, and maybe had identified some questions about how that was coming together. Uh, again, I saw some things in the paper, but I think um, as we've had a chance to look through those more, I think we know that there are um, some pieces there that uh, like the $1 million broadband that's covered but included there that's above and beyond some of it. Some of the water authority expenditures that the water authority was out loud about early, about doing say 10 years of preventive maintenance or preventive replacement ahead of um, that's included in there. But uh, Ms. Nair or Mr. Real, could you give us an update sort of on what we see there? I, obviously we're still waiting on Congress if that ever happens to pass a budget to finish the to make the uh, grant available agreement, but what is the administration's understanding now of our current ART budget uh, and obligations there? I, I think it's not as big as it might have seemed um, as the old administration might have been going out the door. Well, um, Mr. President and Councilor, let me just uh, describe to you that uh, at this point we were doing a very broad uh, overview of that project in particular. 
I will tell you that uh, in meeting with the staff, we have uh, begun to drill down on some of the expenditures and some of the programs. Uh, for example, the, the issue associated with the infrastructure and improvements that were done as part of the art project, uh, we did receive additional funding through the transportation programs uh, through the Council of Governments for, for improvements, for example, to the interchange of Lomas and Central. That was a project that was needed to be done by the city but was not necessarily part of art, but because art was being constructed, it was rolled into that project, so it made it look like the project was a lot more expensive, right? We've done some additional work, as you said, the broadband, uh, some of the work along the sidewalks, improvements, lighting, et cetera. A lot of those projects that were added on. So the entire budget for, for if you will, that I think people had talked about was about 135 million, roughly, for, for the art project. But when you drill down and you take some of those additional, additional work that actually was done, and I would say probably done correctly in the sense that it was a construction project that needed to get done, and so we, you, we took advantage of that opportunity. Uh, the actual art piece of it is the, the piece that's uh, of, of interest in that it's about $119 million yes, for the art program itself. Now, we know that, um, that we are uh, at least our understanding at this point is that the Federal, the Federal Transit Administration has agreed to reimburse the city up to $75 million for that program. The, the challenge is, uh, is basically a bit of the unpredictability that's happening in Washington as we speak with uh, the budget issues, but also the fact that we do not have, at this point, a signed agreement with the Federal Transit Administration on the actual reimbursement of, of funds to the city of Albuquerque. Now, it's my understanding, again, from visiting with staff, that um, the, they have almost but guaranteed that that money would be available once it's appropriated by Congress, and then we would be getting that money in two tranches. Basically, in the, 20, in the current year budget, once that's approved, there's about $50 million in that budget, and then the following year, another $25 million, which would give us the 75 that has been committed. The challenge is, is just the fact is that the city upfronted all of the costs and all the expenses for that program as is required through the process because it's on a reimbursement basis. So now we're, uh, in fact, um, going to meet with the Federal Transit Administration here the next month in, uh, in Dallas to begin to formally put that agreement together and to, get, to ensure that we have an agreement to get those funds reimbursed to the city. And then again, we'll just wait on, on what happens in Washington with the Congress and the President as it relates to the budget. So that gives you a bit of a flavor for that. Um, and um, as we've said, I, and the Mayor said uh, at the press conference, our, our interest is in making sure that, that the city's money that was put out for the project is reimbursed with it, because mm -hmm. it does impact the budget. It's, it's money that was swept across the board from, the, from all the programs to make the project work. And now we just, our goal is to make sure we get reimbursed and that we then go in and make sure that the project works to, to the best of our ability. Mr. President and Mr. Al, thank you very much for that. That's a great summary and a great place to pick up. And I just wanted to reiterate from what we understood and what, to respond to some of the public questions that we had gotten um, to remind folks, I think ART project uh, is still under contract for the Bahana Houston, the general contractor, or the major contractor there, but as a guaranteed max price. So there's a, a guarantee in there. Um, that hasn't changed according to the, the rules, but it is a, a product of all those other things that were done along the side, and I wanted to just clarify that piece. It's a really important, and I appreciate that. And thanks for that update about uh, on the federal funding and the meeting piece. Let us know how we could be helpful. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the administration, Councillor Benton? Thank you, Mr. Rao, for for that clarification. And yeah, um, you know, before the ART project was was uh, was uh, funded by the federal government. As was stated, um, those of us who use the old intersection of uh, Rio Grande and uh, Rio Grande Central and Lomas, where all of that comes together, knows know that that's been a, a difficult area for for uh, commuters and for the neighborhoods over the years, and for transit as well. Just the bottleneck. So we're hopeful about that. But those were funds. Just to 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 reiterate, those were funds that were uh, uh, that were identified and made part of the. Uh, the transportation uh, infrastructure program of the Council of Governments uh, for some time prior to the ART. 
they were utilized when the construction occurred. And then the, the other uh, question I have with regard to the broadband, do you know anything, uh, Lawrence, about how that, uh, how, how are people going to be plugging into that or benefiting from that? Mr. President and, and Councillor Benton, to be candid about it, you have not gotten that briefing yet. Uh, that is one of my topic areas for tomorrow. <laughs> so I would certainly be happy to give you more detail as soon as I get uh, briefed on that. That and, is uh, something so. that, that constituents have asked about, knowing that, that we're going to have uh, fiber optic, high much higher speed, potentially, right. uh, internet all up and down that corridor. So uh, yeah, I'd be interested in seeing what you come up with. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Let's go ahead and move on to the journal. Councilor Vice President Harris. Thank you, Mr. President. I move approval of the December 4th journal. We have a motion and a second for the approval of the December 4th journal. All those in favor signify by saying yes. Yes, yes opposed. That carries unanimously. Uh, we are now under item seven, communications and introductions. Are there any changes to the letter of introduction? I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC5 on tonight's agenda for final action. EC5 is the Mayor's recommendation of award to Intera Incorporation for the operation and maintenance of Los Angeles landfill, and this requires two-thirds votes. Do we have a second? We have a motion and three seconds. Any questions? All those in favor signify by saying yes. Yes. yes opposed? That carries unanimously. Uh, I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC6 on tonight's agenda for final action. EC6 is the mayor's recommendation of the award of RBC capital for debt obligation bonds and swaps. And this requires two thirds votes. We have a second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? All those in favor signify by saying yes. Yes, opposed, that carries unanimously. And I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC7 on tonight's agenda for final action. EC7 is the Panorama Boulevard Vacation, Isaacson and Afram, and ServTech Inc. agents for Meckenbuyer Construction request vacation of the public right of way for old Panorama Boulevard tracks N2, N3A, Tanawan Priorities, and tracks 18, High Desert, zoned RD, located on the west side of Tramway Boulevard Northeast, between <laughs> Academy Road Northeast and San Antonio Drive Northeast, containing approximately 24 acres. I move a do pass. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying yes. Yes, opposed? That carries unanimously. <coughs> Councilor Harris. Thank you, Mr. President. I move approval of the letter of introduction. We have a motion and a second for the approval of the letter of introductions. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying yes. Yes. Yes, yes opposed? That carries unanimously. Uh, we are now under item eight, reports and committees. Councilor Davis. Thank you, Mr. President. The Finance and Government Operations Committee met on Monday, December 11th and reports out the following items. In the matter of ECs 478 and 479, that they be approved. In the matter of R249, 261, and 262, that they be without recommendation. And in the matter of R260, that it do pass and be acted on at the meeting at which it is reported. I make a motion to accept this report. We have a motion and a second by Councilor Jones. Any questions? All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Opposed? That carries unanimously. Uh, Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. The Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee met on Wednesday, December 13th, 2017, and reports out the following items. In the matter of EC 486, 492, 494, and 496, that they be confirmed and be acted on at the meeting in which they are reported. In the matter of EC 495, that it be confirmed. Mr. President, I make a motion to accept the committee reports. We have a motion and a second to accept the committee reports. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying yes. Yes. Yes, opposed? That carries unanimously. We are now under deferrals and withdrawals. Uh, councilors, are there any withdrawals at this time? Councilor Harris. Thank you, Mr. President. In the matter of 045, amending chapters one and two, ROA, et cetera, I move a deferral until February 21st. We have a motion and a second to defer 045 until February the 21st. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying yes. Yes, yes opposed? That carries unanimously. Uh, next, uh, Councilor Winter. Oh, Thank you, Mr. President. This is O-55, prohibiting elected officials of departments, boards, commissions, advisory groups of the City of Albuquerque from organizing, sponsoring, advertising, or hosting political forums. I move deferral until January 17th. We have a motion and a second by Councilor Benton to defer uh, item O-55 until January the 17th. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Opposed? That carries unanimously. Councilor Pena. Or substitute R-145. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, 
145 is directing the administration to install four-way stop signs at the intersections of Batan, um, Batan Drive, Gonzales Road, Southwest and Camino, San Martin and 86th Street, directing the administration to study 98th Street Southwest and Amola Mesa Drive Southwest, making appropriation, I move to withdraw. We have a motion and a second to withdraw. Any questions? See none, all those in favor signify by saying yes. Yes, yes. opposed, that carries unanimously. We are now under the consent agenda. I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. And I'd like to, Councilor Bett. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I'd like to uh, pull item C from the consent agenda. That's uh, EC 17439, Solid Waste Management Department, uh, air quality impacts of uh, compressed natural gas in lieu of diesel fuel. And I also would like to pull item G, EC 459. Thank you, Mr. President. I move with those changes, approval of the consent agenda. We have a motion and a second for approval of the consent agenda, excluding, excluding those two items. All those in favor, signify by saying yes. Yes. Yes, opposed? That carries unanimously. Councilor Benton. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, yeah, if uh, someone from uh, Solid Waste could, could come down, Mr. Salde, or whoever's here from Solid Waste, I'd like to ask about the, uh, this uh, objective report. Director Soloway, welcome. Good evening, sir. Good Mr. Evening. President. Um, uh, Mr. Soloway, uh, appreciate the work on this report. You know, uh, this issue of, uh, of our fuels for heavy vehicles is something I've been interested in a long time, but primarily at, at uh, transit and uh, solid waste. But um, I did. Uh, note in the report that uh, there are some potential savings to be achieved uh, through a conversion, at least a part of the fleet, I suppose, not necessarily all of them, uh, to, uh, uh, of the heavy vehicles to, to uh, <clears throat> change over to natural gas, even with the cost of uh, putting in the infrastructure to fuel the vehicles, uh, there's significant, significant savings to be achieved. Um, but I did want to ask about some of the comments in there that referred to the waste transfer facility and its location vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, I suppose it would be the, the regular delivery trucks. We're not talking necessarily about the heavy trucks that would be transferring waste, but, but our regular uh, uh, waste collection vehicles, uh, it, this would not work because of the technology and the distances involved. Could you just comment on that briefly? I just wanted to understand that. Um, Mr. President, Councilor Benton, I want to be sure I, I heard the entire question. What you're asking me is whether or not it makes sense with direct haul for collection vehicles to convert to um, compressed natural gas. Well, I guess my question is, were we, were we not to implement the waste transfer facility, my understanding from the report, or maybe it was just from the staff write-up, but, but from what I read, was that uh, vehicles in the far east side of the city, uh, it would not work for them to be on natural gas, even though it's cleaner for the neighborhood air and so forth and more economical to the city. But if they were to be traveling from the east side of the city all the way to Cerro Colorado, as they do today, that they could not it would not work in terms of their, uh, I guess there's just the capacity of those vehicles to, uh, to run those distances. Uh, Mr. President, Council Benton, it's actually a range issue. It's a matter of how many diesel gallon equivalents we can fit on the collection vehicles. And it varies by the vehicle type. Um, a front load is a little bit different than, than an, um, an ASL or a side load type um, truck. And it's a matter of how many um, containers we can fit on the truck. Uh, we should be able to get uh, close to 100 to 120 diesel miles as far as range goes, mm -hmm. which would make it viable um, throughout the entire city. The issue is when you complicate it with weather or uh, additional traffic, whether or not we'd have enough spare capacity to be able to convert the whole fleet without having uh, logistical issues associated mm -hmm. with it. 
The report also recognized the fact that it's a three-legged school, uh, three-legged stool. Um, you have to have the fueling infrastructure in place. You have to have the maintenance facility in place. That's why it references back to the transfer station because that's one of the components of the trans proposed transfer station is an updated maintenance facility capable of maintaining the uh, uh, natural gas vehicles. And then the third part of it is just the pure economics of buying the vehicles, paying the premium costs, and, um, and, and getting the return you're talking about with it. The report shows that when diesel fuel remains consistently above $2.50, it really comes down to the cost of the fuel for the return. Okay. And, and the, I think there were two analyses, there are two parts of the report. One really had to do what I, what, what, with what I would call local air quality, just in the neighborhood of the vehicles going through by passing your house. And the other was as requested in the, in the, uh, and the request for the objective report was the uh, global kind of greenhouse gas production. And uh, my understanding from that was on the greenhouse gas, uh, natural gas, you know, on the face of it looks pretty good, but then when you look for exploration and some of, at least the, the processes that are currently being used for exploration and drilling, it, it becomes less, uh, uh, less attractive but, but not less attractive, it becomes more or less on par with diesel, whereas in a local environment of just a neighborhood, it's a, it's a cleaner emissions. Does that characterize it correctly? Uh, Mr. President, uh, Councilor Benton, it's a pretty good analysis. All right. Um, from a CO standpoint, um, one is higher than the other. Um, one's higher in NOx than the other. Right. When you balance it all out, um, they're, they're pretty equal from an emission right. standpoint. Um, in the neighborhoods, um, it, based on the utilization, um, it, the, the natural gas for automated side loaders is cleaner okay. for local emissions. And, and the proposed facility there did have a fueling, as part of the plan at least, a fueling station for natural gas, and, and the new maintenance facilities would be adequate for that, correct? Mr. President, Councilor Benton, that's correct. All right. Thank you. M Mr. Thank President, you, Mr. can I follow briefly? Yes, go ahead. And, and Councilor Benton, I appreciate these questions. I think it's really important. Mr. Soliday, thank you. And I just want to point out, if, if we move forward on this or wanted to revisit, um, since the budget objective was created, uh, the company that's making our uh, all-electric buses for ART is now uh, marketing all-electric uh, transit uh, transfer units as well for sanitation. Um, it addresses that methane issue that's on a bigger scale and certainly a big issue for us here in the West and in New Mexico, um, and some that's on par, obviously, with that range being one of those questions that's uh, being addressed, but it's an opportunity for us to look at that, particularly as we're building out our solar facilities for transit uh, and others on the West side. It'd be an opportunity for us to take a new look at that um, and how that might be another option as well. So thank you. We've had one individual sign up for EC439 to speak, and that is David Wood. Would you please come forward? Welcome, Mr. Wood. Merry Christmas, uh, President Sanchez, counselors. Briefly, what I want to say about the integrated waste management pro project is really two things. First of all, it was submitted by the prior administration, and I'm not sure that the current administration has had the time to thoroughly review it. They're requesting a d uh, deferral. Yes, yeah. I <laughs> I just couldn't pull myself, so I just so I'm up here anyway. Uh, beyond that, uh, I do want to point out that uh, at the risk of uh, of getting the administration mad at me, uh, there could be a pending announcement that would uh, uh, negate uh, some significant portions of that integrated waste management plan. So I just wanted to point that out as well, and I hope I didn't get myself in trouble with the administration. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Councilor Benton. Just to clarify, the administration wanted to defer not this, but the other one? Till both, both bills. Oh, both of them. Correct. Okay. So I'll move a deferral on item C, C17439. Until January 17th, we have a motion yeah. and a second by Council Vice President Harris. 
Any questions? All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Opposed? That carries unanimously. And I'd also like to move, uh, I'd like to defer EC 459 until January the 17th. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Opposed? That carries unanimously. We are now under general public comments. Uh, there will be a two minute time limit. The light on the podium will be green for the first minute and a half. Then the bell will ring and the light will turn yellow, indicating you have 30 seconds remaining to wrap up your comments. At the two minute mark, the light will turn red. I'm going to call the first four speakers up. There is uh, availability in the front uh, for you to sit so we can keep the process moving. Uh, the first speaker is Tom Dent, followed by Don Schrader, followed by Adrian Barboa, followed by Elizabeth Wagner. So once your name has been called, please come to the front. Thank you. Mr. Dent, go and proceed. Hi. Good evening, counselors. I am uh, submitting a transcript from, uh, on behalf of Pete Dinelli from his blog today uh, in regards to the uh, December 15th Albuquerque Journal uh, article of sick leave uh, ordinance proposed to city councilors seek fair policy after na narrow defeat on the ballot initiative in October. I'm going to read some excerpts since there's not much time. Uh, the Sanchez-Harris proposed mandatory sick leave ordinance has some similarities but is yet very different to the healthy workforce ordinance that failed in the October 3rd municipal election. The Sanchez-Harris proposed sick leave ordinance will not apply to businesses with fewer than 50 employees and it will not apply to temporary workers. Unlike the ordinance voted down, the Sanchez-Harris ordinance leaves out the rebuttable presumption that any adverse action against an employee taken within 90 days of the employee being out sick is retaliation. Um, Elizabeth Wagner, an attorney with the New Mexico Center on Law and Poverty, said the proposed ordinance as written would be the sickest, week, uh, sickest uh, the, the weakest sick leave bill in the, in the country. Uh, for the last eight years, Sanchez and Harris, and for that matter, the entire city council have rubber stamped, stamped all the former Republican, all that the former Republican mayor did, including the art bus project and the final adoption of the ABCZ comprehensive plan that will have a long-term impact on our neighborhoods and favors developers. When over 20,000 petition signers were collected, petition signatures were collected last year for the mandatory sick leave ordinance known as the Healthy Workforce Ordinance. Sanchez and Harris were nowhere to be found in support of it. But both Sanchez and Harris were Mr. Dent, thank you. Your time has expired. Thank right. you. Thank you. Don Schrader. Can somebody take this? Thank you. My parents might have been good friends had they never married. Marriage destroys many friendships. Some couples become better friends after divorce. If I had been my mother, I do not know how I could have coped being married to my dad. <laughs> if I had been my dad, I do not know how I could have coped being married to my mother. Married 48 years until my mother died, much of the time, it was emotional war. I learned from them not to get trapped in a miserable marriage. I aim to tell the truth. I aim not to make foolish promises. Do I ever, do I ever know myself or the other person or the future? well enough to know for sure we both will do well with only each other romantically until death. A solemn vow many make and break or want to break. A solemn vow I refuse to make to anyone. I treasure being in love with certain men. Like many people, I am able to be deeply and openly in love with more than one person at the same time. Yes 
to passionate romance. Legal marriage, for me, never. Adrian Barboa. Please, no applause. Followed by Elizabeth Wagner. Welcome. Hello. Um, good evening, Mr. President and members of the council. My name is Adrienne Barboa. I am the field director at Strong Families New Mexico. Strong Families is a proud member of APD Forward, a community coalition made up of 17 organizations and several family members of affected by police violence. <clears throat> On December 14th, AP, APD Forward sent a letter to all of you, city council and your policy staff, um, so hopefully you receive that because we're concerned with the council's request for an audit of the federal independent monitor, Dr. James Ginger. APD Ford is here tonight to share our concerns with you in the request that the city council repeal or amend the resolution. Our first concern is that the request of the requested audit is procedurally incorrect. The CASA and the order governing the monitor's payment both contain dispute resolution procedures that involve notice to all parties and to the court. It is our understanding that no notice to the parties or to the court has occurred. Second, the scope of the request audit is overly broad. The contract with Dr. Ginger is a flat fee contract where each side bears risk regarding actual versus budgeted cost, and Dr. Ginger was the lowest bid amongst the applicants for independent monitor. Under the CASA, the city may request records of expenses from the monitor, but only with the notice to the monitor and to the court. Again, it is our understanding that no notice has been provided to the parties or to the court. Finally, the issue of the monitor's performance is exclusively within the jurisdiction of the federal court. City Council's resolution calls for a blanket review of the performance of the independent monitor, a subject which the CASA makes clear is reserved solely for the court. This separation of powers is critical to the integrity of the reform process and protects the process from outside political pressure. For these reasons, we respectfully ask the council to repeal resolution 17252, or alternatively, to Ms. narrow Barboa, the your time scope has expired. of the resolution to Thank reflect you. the terms of the court-approved settlement agreement Thank signed you. by the city. Time has expired. Thank Thanks you. for your time. Next speaker, Elizabeth Wagner. Council Not a question for the speaker, but um, perhaps for the sponsors of, of that bill. What about this notification question of, of notification of the of the court? Do we know what's required and whether we've done it? I'm not sure if there's a notification uh, in, the, in court time. Obviously, the court was notified because the judge brought it up, I guess, in the hearing. And I don't think, uh, based on what this woman said, there's any approval by the court. I think we just have to notify people, and there was lots of notification. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wagner, go ahead and proceed. Good evening, Mr. President and members of the council. Um, my name is Elizabeth Wagner. I'm an attorney with the New Mexico Center on Law and Poverty. Uh, we support efforts to pass an earned sick leave ordinance in the city of Albuquerque so that no working family has to choose between earning a paycheck and taking care of a sick child. Um, the media has reported that an earned sick leave ordinance will be introduced tonight by Councilors uh, Sanchez and Harris, um, which unfortunately will not help the families who have to make that choice. Um, I'm very familiar with sick leave legislation around the country. Uh, 28 other cities and nine states have passed sick leave ordinances. And if passed, this truly would be the worst sick leave legislation in the country. Um, it excludes many part-time workers, most of whom want full-time jobs or work multiple jobs to make ends meet. It excludes between 90 to 95% of Albuquerque businesses from coverage altogether. Uh, and it denies coverage for many important family caregiving relationships. So if your mother or your grandmother falls and breaks her hip, you can't take sick time under this ordinance to care for her. Um, nieces, siblings, grandchildren, domestic partners, and many other important family caregiving relationships aren't covered by this draft ordinance. Uh, and lastly, if uh, you are lucky enough to be covered, this law has the lowest sick time accrual rate in the country and the longest wait period, uh, one of the longest wait periods to be able to actually use sick leave. So for example, an employee working 20 hours a week would have to wait 34 weeks uh, in order to be able to use leave. Uh, better models are out there. Albuquerque families deserve something better than last place. 
Um, we really hope you will uh, use my organization, use me as a resource to develop a better sick time policy and that you'll consider the needs of working families uh, who would be excluded by this legislation as you work to make improvements to this law. I'm happy to answer any questions and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. Next speaker is Brenda McKenna, followed by C.C. Riley, followed by Elizabeth Dackery, followed by Colleen Gorman. And again, once your name has been called, please come forward. Go ahead and proceed. Good, Welcome. Good evening, President and Council members. I do have handouts for all the city councilors. President, can I hand them? Just give them to staff and they'll okay. get them to us. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, an Albuquerque firearms dealer is sponsoring a coyote killing contest later this month. Prizes for slaughtering the smallest, the biggest, are belts, <coughs> belt buckles, that is, and firearms. I have reviewed City Ordinance 9242, which is in the packet I've given to you, given, the, given that it's in the envelope there. And there's no exception for a killing contest. Moreover, the organizer has asked the participants to bring the carcasses to his storefront, which is in city limits. I think the city should be concerned about this. This sadly is not rare in New Mexico or in the um, United States. It, it happens in quite a few states. There has been bills proposed at the state legislature that have not been successful, but most recently we, we were able to pass at the Senate chamber. A resolution from this city council supporting the ban of, ban of these events would help to support a statewide ban I respectfully request this body support such a resolution and bring an end to this wanton slaughter of wildlife. Thank you. Councilor Benton. So um, the, you stated and it appears from this language uh, that the existing city ordinance already prohibits this activity. Well, it, it doesn't specifically say a coyote killing contest. Right. However, um, it does say that the only exceptions to killing an animal would be humane euthanasia, killing a bird uh, for food, killing a rabbit for food, killing mice or rats. Um, it doesn't say anything about a killing contest for prizes. Right. So. Um as far as I know, discharging a weapon, at least a, a firearm in the city for something like this would be illegal anyway, right? That's my understanding. But However, the, the issue is that the fact that the sponsor of this, the, the shop that is sponsoring it, is doing business within the city of Albuquerque? Yes, and it's not clear where the participants will discharge firearms. Right. It could be within the city, and it's my understanding that would be a misdemeanor only if it's witnessed by a deputy, or they could be going right outside the city and using the electronic callers to bring in the coyotes, and then they're killed. Yeah, I, I appreciate your bringing this to my attention, and I would just ask that the administration uh, through uh, through the animal welfare department, uh, check and see whether whether any sort of enforcement can be made against the sponsor of this uh, this contest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Winter. Thank you, Mr. President. And and I guess this is a. I don't know why they do this. What do you think the purpose is for these gun shops to do this? And I know that you had mentioned that they, they're going to bring all the carcasses back into the city at his shop. And I did see a couple pictures of truckloads of carcasses. What did, what, and then what do they do with the carcasses? I, I just don't understand what the, the reasoning is for this. I'm not sure, and I haven't talked to the sponsor of this particular contest, but I do know that coyote fur is sold to manufacturers of clothing, um, he he may ha he might have those plans, uh, but then 
my concern is what, what happens to the entrails? Where is he gonna to propose to dump that or if he, if he is gonna dump it? And unfortunately, the coyote doesn't have any protection whatsoever in the state. Councilor Davis. Very briefly, Mr. President, I think we all agree. <clears throat> I, I see where this is going, this could take a minute, but I think there's some environmental health questions there. There may be some issues around ordinances. And so maybe we could ask Ms. Holtz or someone uh, from the administration to outline a letter that, we could, uh, that we've done this before on people, whether it's a special event or anything else, whether it's city approved or sanctioned or not, to just outline some of the concerns and city ordinances that might impact this. Obviously, we can't regulate if somebody goes to Torrance County and, and shoots an animal and brings it here, but there may be some other impacts that uh, that need to be looked at and addressed by the sponsor ahead of time. And given how quickly and timely this is, perhaps we could hopefully do that fairly quickly, whether it's environmental health, um, you know, outlining our public safety regulations and others that might be helpful in determining how best they could either decide to do this or, or withdraw it and do something different. President, Councillor Davis, um, the city legal department would be happy to look, look into any ordinances and do some research. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McKenna. Thank you, uh, President. Our next speaker is C.C. Riley, followed by Elizabeth Dakari. Good evening, and Larry and Pat. Uh, my name is C.C. Riley. I won't uh, go to great length with my uh, credentials right now, uh, suffice it to say, I'm a sovereignty risk analyst. I did that on Wall Street. I was a member of New York Society Security Analysts. I was interviewed on uh, Moneyline Show, and I have worked also in um, Europe for the European uh, un uh, Union. Um, in downtown Albuquerque now with the economic development, which I expected to be called under item four, um, I live there, south of Central and east of 10th Street, which is supposed to be fair game for um, what at this point was told to me to be using eminent domain <coughs> with uh, including um, large, num large percentages of uh, uh, Section 8 housing in any uh, edifices that would be built in that area, as they have started doing already. Uh, we, there's a building on 10th and <clears throat> Central that started out looking very good and now has homeless people sleeping um, in the corridors and, and in addition to uh, drug sellers and drug users being in the building and the rental agent being um, refusing to do anything about it. Well, back in New York, and just quickly, I'm going to say that the biggest problems with low-income housing in New York, uh, in drug hubs, are gangs, uh, drug dealers, whores, and people with HIV AIDS. There is no law here that makes people who are infected with HIV AIDS make it clear to pe thank you very people much they want to have sex expired. with Thank you. And announce it before they have the sex. Next speaker, Elizabeth Takari, followed by Colleen Gorman, <coughs> followed by Salvador Barros, followed by Barbara Grothes. Good Welcome. evening, Mr. President, and good evening, counselors. My name is Elizabeth DeSherry, and though I live in Valencia County, I volunteer routinely here in Albuquerque, and I'm a retired emergency room nurse having worked at a major hospital here. And I am speaking in opposition to coyote killing contests. The contest will be held on December 30th and 31st. That is a holiday weekend. And as somebody who has personally seen the carcasses of the coyotes that are discarded in different areas, I found the carcass of a coyote with a block in its mouth um, under a Arroyo Bridge near a city. I am very concerned that a business in Albuquerque has decided to sponsor a contest. These contests are a race to kill coyotes for a prize, and the prizes are usually typically firearms or cash. Um, the contests are likely, they're going to be in Albuquerque, um, organizing this contest, but they will be likely shooting in areas outside of Albuquerque, including counties within a 50 to 75 mile range of Albuquerque, including my county. 
Um, as you heard, coyotes, there is basically no, no restrictions on killing coyotes. They can be taken by any means, no bag limits, no defined season. We have at least 30 coyote killing contests a year in New Mexico with some of these contests organized right here in the middle Rio Grande Valley. And I just want to say that they contribute to a negative image of our state. The killing contests are counterproductive to land management <coughs> practices, and they are a public health and safety risk. Thank you very much. Mr. Sherry, thank you very much. Next speaker, Colleen Gorman, followed by Salvador Barros. <coughs> Welcome. <coughs> um, good evening, Mr. President and City Council. Thank you for. Um, <clears throat> um, my name is Colleen Gorman. I am Navajo. I'm a high school social studies teacher. I'm an artist. <clears throat> um, I recently completed a mural for the city called Women in New Mexico. I'm a member of the Angry Brown Poets and a former member of the Albuquerque Slam team that we represented at the National Poetry Slam. I'm here today because as board president of Quote Unquote Incorporated, which is a 501c3, um, its core, I'm here because I am a supporter of its core values, which is freedom of speech, democracy, media education, and literacy through training, production, and programming opportunities. As a grassroots startup, <clears throat> the original goal was to develop community TV where regular people could learn how to create their own TV programs for broadcast in New Mexico and beyond. As a national leader, we advocated for the Community Cable Act of 1984 by Congress that required all cable companies to allocate funding to pub PEG channels, public education and government access channels, so that because they make profit on public rights away. As a Native American and as a woman, as a supporter of freedom of speech and platforms for democracy where public forums allow for community to arrive at solutions, I am asking City Council to immediately end you public's contract to up operate public access channel 27, not to extend it for a month or six months, because <clears throat> we have documented um, that they have embezzled, embezzled public funds for private gain, and despite an April 2016 letter of concern and two letters of non-compliance since then, they continue to disallow public access to pub public access to public access, and censorship, and playing commercial content on non-commercial channels. Before Mayor Barry had the city break in through the roof of our facilities and station armed guards to not allow employees to do our jobs, we were fifth in the nation with new and local programming. We supported people with disabilities to program and produce content. We have Native Americans, Ms. Gorman, your Muslims, time has expired. I and apologize. democracy Thank you. now. So, Thank you. please, in support of democracy and platforms democracy and you public's contract and put the RFP out there for someone Thank you. else. Next speaker is Salvador Barros, followed by Barbara Grothes, followed by Todd Kirstein. This is Salvador Barros, and he wanted to say something. We started out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Barbara Grothes, Todd Kirstein, and Janet Sears, welcome. Uh, good evening, uh, President Sanchez and city councilors. We worked hard for you, Cynthia, and we've elected a majority of Democrats to the city council. <clears throat> At your last meeting, the West Side councilors appear to have uh, joined a in collusion with conservative members of our city council against the wishes of the people. I believe, Mr. Sanchez, you campaigned as a true Democrat when you ran, and I'm wondering what does that mean to be a true Democrat? Does that mean you're going to continue to collude with people and put our budget in the hands of people who clearly left our city in dire straits through poor uh, decision making and uh, the expenditure of dollars, the, the, um, uh, the collusion against the DOJ has cost us an enormous amount of money and now you people are trying to blame the monitor for this. We've already heard testimony about that tonight we are here to let you know we are watching you now. 
If you don't want to support the voters who voted you into office, we are paying attention and we are going to hold you accountable. So I hope you will uh, keep this in mind, uh, Ms. Pena, Mr. Sanchez, and Ms. Borrego. We do not want Santalina. We campaigned against it. Your citizens don't want it on the west side. You talk to them. They don't want the traffic. They don't want the congestion. And we don't want sprawl. That water belongs to all of us. Thank you for your time. We're Thank watching. You. Todd Kirstein, followed by Janet Sayers, followed by Ted Naminsky. Thank you, President Sanchez, Councilors. Uh, it was, my name is Todd Kirstein. I, I enjoy helping people and communities grow through the game of golf. And I think back to 1989 when um, I approached uh, Dan Duran, who was a director of Parks and Rec, and I'll never forget him saying, you know, are, are you crazy? And it, it was when I presented to him an idea to bring communities together at Arroyo del Oso Golf Course on Christmas Eve. And it started off as luminarias, and the first year we had three hot air balloons. And I'm fortunate to say now, after I presented uh, Mr. Durand with this presentation of a vision of bringing people together, he, he got it. And uh, I'm happy to say this Sunday night, I welcome everybody uh, again, as well as the 30 hot air balloons now that will be displayed at 445 to 7 at Roy Deloso Golf Course. Uh, and it stays in line with uh, actually the book that Councilor Gibson brought up. It's a great book, Dreamland. And that's what we're trying to create as well through uh, some golf clinics that I will be starting in January uh, at Porto del Sol Golf Course at high noon. So I'll give you and your staff more information as that time nears. Um, but having said that, I just want to thank also the other Parks and Rec directors through the years and my boss for allowing uh, us to continue this tradition. So thank you very much. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Janet Sears. Welcome back, Janet. I, it, it has been a while. Uh, well, good evening, Mr. President and members of the council. And I just wanted to comment on a few projects. Uh, first of all is to thank the council staff and in particular, I believe Sandy Chavis, who coordinated the December 1st swearing in. I've gone to a lot of them, and I think it was probably one of the best. I appreciated the fact that the PA system was great, and that even if you were at the very back of the room, you could hear and, and see and participated. And I really appreciated the string quartet and the vocalist. I think my days of uh, rock and roll dancing after swearing ins are finished. But anyway, it was a lovely event and I saw people of all uh, ages, ethnic groups. Uh, I'm, it was a very community event. Uh, the next thing I wanted to mention is I'm the president of the Del Norte High School Alumni Association of which uh, Councillor Gibson represents quite a bit of our um, attendance area along with Councillor Winter. And the good news is uh, we've given $28,000 of scholarships over the last five years, and we're on target to raise five, oh, excuse me, to give 10,000 in scholarships this year. And I just wanted to say that because it's, I mean, a lot is going on in the community, the, uh, private sector donations, people, uh, alumni wanting to give back. So I, it's just a happy thing. Uh, next is my Albuquerque Historical Society. Every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, we do a free walking tour of downtown Central. We start at, at First and Central, talk about the coming of the railroad and then historical buildings. There's 11 of us who are tour guides. It's free, we give our time. And I, uh, we had over 400 participants on 40 different Saturdays. This la is that the end? Am I over? That's the end. Or do I have 30 seconds? Anyway, um, so we just want to, we're happy to donate our time and, and get people uh, to understand about downtown. Councilor Gibson. 
Yes, thank you. Questions? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, not really a question, just uh, mm -hmm. would like to thank you, you know, for, for uh, doing the tours, for one mm -hmm. thing, but also uh, for everything that you do to help school kids, Del Norte, the schools that feed into them. Um, and what else? you're on open space? I've served on the Open Space Advisory Board, and are you there there, there now? Or I, I was term limited out, so oh, that, okay. that's fine. <laughs> anyway. But I know you've done a lot for the city of Albuquerque, and, and I really want to thank you for that, particularly your work for the schools. Happy to do it. So, and and good luck with the fundraising. Good oh. cause, Councilor Borrego. Thank you, Janet Sayers, and thank you, fellow AMAFCA board member. Yes. Um, Janet also served on the AMAFCA, and she's done a lot of things in a very positive spirit for the city, including running for office. And yes. um, Janet, you and I worked together for many years, and I'm really happy to see you. Thank you. And in closing, and just thank you all for the time, energy, the sacrifice you make to uh, serve on the city council and, and be here hundreds of hours, thousands, I don't know what. Thank you. Councilor Benton. So just to reiterate, Saturday mornings, 10 a.m., right? Yes, although we're on our holiday break. Okay. Well, we come, come back during on the holiday. Uh, Saturday, January the 6th, and all of the information is on our Albuquerque Historical Society website. 10 a.m., though, first and second. 10 a.m., we'll be there. Rain, snow, wind, and if nobody shows up, we go home. But we, we uh, we're there. Great, so. thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Tad Naminsky, followed by uh, Tashawn Buffin, followed by Paul Ryan McKinney. Thank, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you. My name is Tad Naminsky. Well, 19, mil 19 million so far in interest for the art project. What about next two, three, five years? How many, <clears throat> how many millions of additional uh, in interest? No, okay. Now let's go back to Central Avenue, Fifth Street, Zuni, Copper. What they have in common? One way each direction. Well, what really got me? Right here between San Mateo, Copper between San Mateo and San Pedro, one way, including on the driving lane, bicycle lane. Well, let's go here on the Fifth Street in downtown, or next uh, south, from here south by library. They put right on the middle of one half parking spaces and bicycle next to the and ne next one, if you want to make it, only one lane going south. If you want to make it turn left on right, you block every whole traffic. That is smart idea. Who's the idiot? Design, idiot design approved. I'm sick and tired of this kind of work. People also fed up in Abikorki, drivers. Well, you also in uh, also endangering drivers when you put bicycle together. Well, every bicycle should be licensed, insured, bonded, and registered. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Trishan Buffin. Welcome. Good evening. Um, thank you, Mr. President and uh, council members. My name is Treshawn Buffin, and I'm a resident and taxpayer of the city of Albuquerque, as well as a member of Olay. I'm also a full-time student studying engineering at CNM and a part-time worker averaging about 15, 15 hours a week. The, the sick leave ordinance that will be proposed tonight will leave me without the ability to earn uh, pay sick time off. Excuse me. <laughs> um, and due, due to my commitment to school, I don't, I don't have the luxury to work full-time hours. 
And there are a lot of people out there, like many of my friends, that have either personal or um, health circumstances that are keeping them from being able to work those full-time hours. And like the people that are covered with the proposed ordinance, we too get sick and we all deserve the right to be able to earn the time off to be able to take care of ourselves and loved ones when we're not feeling well. To the sponsors of this ordinance, at your earliest convenience, I am more than happy to sit down and talk with you guys about the realities of Albuquerque workers. Um, let's work together to build a paid sick leave policy that not only benefits businesses, but Albuquerque workers in the community as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Ryan McKinney, followed by Simon Polakowski, followed by Thank you, President Sanchez, and I guess uh, congratulations are in order for President Sanchez, Vice President Harris, my, uh, my favorite bipartisan duo. We have a Republican that supports sick leave, mandatory government enforced sick leave, and a Democrat who supports corporate welfare, so we get best of both worlds. But uh, what I really wanted to talk about was RA 14-1. President Sanchez, I don't know if you remember RA 14-1, but uh, you introduced that back when you were president, 2014, crackdown on free speech. Now we have some folks in the audience tonight with little index cards with eyes on them. Can you guys hold those up for me, please? Now, political ideology speaking. Please address the council and no index cards, please. Thank you. That, that, it's what I was getting at. Um, political ideology aside, we, we disagree probably almost 100%. Me, them, you know, I want to be clear, you know, libertarian individual, definitely not a member of the Democratic Party. Um, but, man, I'd like, love to be able to see them in the back with a huge banner. A huge banner reminding you guys that, yeah, they're watching. They put a lot of work in to get six Democrats, well, I guess not all six last time, but get uh, four Democrats elected uh, last election, and uh, you guys are ignoring them. I mean, the sick leave... Our bill is, our ordinance is the perfect example. Nobody likes it. Actual liberty-minded folks and conservatives don't like it. Progressives don't like it. Nobody likes it. Your corporate bodies are the only ones that like it. Um, you know, I was at a Sandoval County meeting recently where they were talking about a real hot-button issue of right to work. Folks had banners. Folks applauded. Nothing happened. It was okay. You know, we could bring free speech back here. And I would like to thank you for not slamming the gavel down when we applauded the young ladies that were uh, sharing their talent with us. So thank you for having some consideration. Next speaker, Simon Polakowski. Followed by Chris Bregman, followed by Diane McCash. And if your name has been called, please come to the front and be prepared to speak. Council President, Council. Um, First, I think you should fire off a thank you note to the prior administration for handing you a, what, six million plus dollar budget deficit for Christmas. Uh, and also, I've noticed over the years I've been coming down to council, there are a lot of people that are very concerned about Albuquerque, New Mexico, and this country. And this is the only place they can communicate to their representatives directly. and. I don't think they expect miracles from you, but uh, you know, council has a lot of very important issues to deal with. If council is unable to deal with these issues, why not give the public a forum, like public access, where they can find like-minded people so they can organize and do things on their own, of which council is unable to or unwilling to do. And we used to have a public access station where you could come on with whatever it is that was bothering you or whatever it is that you wanted to entertain people with, and you could get it across to the public on your time. And if nobody wanted to listen to it, they didn't have to turn tune to it. You know, they could turn it off. But if people were interested, they could watch it. You could put a telephone number up and say, please contact me. You did it weekly. And uh, you could keep abreast of what was going on with whatever it was that concerned you or whatever it, w it is that you uh, like to entertain people with. We don't have that. We haven't had that for the last five years. All these people that come here, they have concerns. They really, I believe they all want to do you know, good things. The average person is decent. 
give the lowriders a program that they can say, what happened this week cruising up and down Central? Give the pawnbrokers uh, hour that they can say, this is what we do. This is the service we provide. And this is what you're not being seen. Let, give us a podium where we can contact the public that will listen. Thank you. Thank Mr. you, Mr. President, briefly. Councilor Davis. If I could ask staff, Ms. Yara, to clarify for us. I think if I recall, and I think staff reminded me during those questions, the current uh, GovTV public access contract expires next week or so at the end of the year. So I think the original intent with the extension last time was for us to appoint some members to the cable board, give an extension to the end of the year, and then to issue an RFP. Do I recall that correctly and, and can we? Yes, Mr. President, Councillor Davis, you are correct. Um, the main contract with um, Public expired June 30th of this year and it was extended through the end of December. Um, that at, During that time, I think they have made all the appointments to the cable board and it has met, I know at least once since then. Um, I, I am unsure about the status of issuing the new RFP, I can check with the purchasing division tomorrow. Um, but I'm not sure if the new administration has had time to review the issue. Thank you, Mr. Art. I realize it's not a, a, a public safety issue, so we probably have to do another short-term <coughs> extension for that. But I think it's something we've heard about for some time now and, uh, and caring for it from the old administration and the old council um, was a priority to be sure we try to get that out and start that process um, would be great to hopefully do that. So we'd appreciate the administration's help in helping us get that out as we get things in, people in place. Thanks. Councilor Benton. It, and I, I do acknowledge also, as, as does uh, Councilor Davis, that the administration has a lot on its plate to deal with right now. But this is something that, that I certainly have a lot of sympathy for, um, the group that lost their station. It really was, I mean, I had friends who had shows. I appeared many times on, on quote unquote, just talking about the, a lot of the same things we talk about here and, and uh, helping inform people. and. Um, there was every kind of show. Um, it was a huge diversity of shows. And um, whether or not, quote unquote, comes back, I think we really need to get this RFP out sooner rather than later. And, and I would just advocate for the shortest possible uh, extension. I realize it's probably not a good thing in terms of branding and all that for the station to go dark. Uh, so, so that was a lot of the rationale that was made, but, and I don't know whether the cable board is planning to weigh in or have they weighed in with regard to where we're heading with all of this, but uh, um, I think we need to get a new R RFP out there sooner rather than later. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Chris Bregman. Um, hello, counselors. My name is Chris Bergman. I'm 23 years old. I'm currently a work-study tutor at CNM, but I'm also a gamer. Uh, according to numerous gaming websites, there's an estimated 2.2 billion gamers around the world. Recently, in this last November, uh, a company named um, EA Electronic Arts uh, put out a game called Star Wars Battlefront 2. EA, with this game, has been practicing gambling tactics uh, with this game and others. This is important because this targets children and gamers um, as well. So the way they do it, they have this thing called loot boxes which is basically a box that literally has items you need to be good at the game and excel at it. And to get these items, um, there's only two ways to do it, is to get it through playing the game, which cannot work because you don't get them consistently, or you have to buy them. And in EA's game, Star Wars, you have to buy them. And these items that allow you to um, become better at the game are not guaranteed. Yes, they have items that can help you succeed, but they are not, um, things that you can just go out and buy, use your money to get. This is where the gambling part comes in. Um, there are things being done. Uh, a senator named Chris Lee from Hawaii is trying to draft a bill right now to make uh, gambling practices like these um, uh, illegal to um, gamers or people under the age of 21. And um, recently, countries such as Belgium, other countries like England, um, and other countries in Asia have launched actual investigations into EA because of these practices. And these, um, these practices, of course, aren't only illegal and are causing legal, um, legal consequences towards EA, but of course these are not, games are not made like that. Games are made for players to have fun, show their skill, and to bring people together. EA using these gambling tactics destroys that, and it destroys gaming 
and um, I wanted to build awareness for you and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bergman. Next speaker is Diane McCash, followed by Edgar Salinas, followed by Alicia Sines, followed by Flora Lucero. Welcome. Hi, I'm Diane McCash. Um, with due respect for how much you do have on your plates right now, I would like to ask that you fast track a resolution to ban ICE from our prisoner transfer station. I don't know what timeline, if any, you might have for formally and publicly rescinding ex-Mayor Berry's and ex-Chief Eden's invitation to ICE to the prisoner transfer station, but I believe it's important to do this sooner rather than later. Whether ICE has been there recently or not, the invitation stands as a community threat. As you know, Bernalillo County Commissioners banned ICE from MDC earlier this year. If we don't follow suit and make it clear that ICE will not be allowed into our prisoner transfer station, we are doing residents and APD a disservice. We need to support APD's mission and policy to serve all residents. Per their own policy, they are not to routinely ask about a person's immigration status, but unless we clearly state that ICE is not welcome at the prisoner transfer station, we make these policies ambiguous. What good does it do if an APD officer concentrates on issues of public safety as per policy, but then delivers a person in custody to the prisoner transfer center with a continuing question of the possibility of interacting with ICE there? We need to do everything we can to protect our immigrant communities, our neighbors, and our families. And we need to do everything we can to allow for the, an increase in trust between APD and our community unambiguously separating our local law enforcement from immigration customs enforcement is an important step toward alleviating some of the stress and mistrust between our community and law enforcement. Thank you. Councillor Gibson, I think she has a question or a yes. comment. Um, comment, actually, maybe a question. Um, we did pass a resolution uh, that said that within the re resolution, part of it was that uh, no city Actually, you know what it was? It wasn't a resolution. It was a memorial to, I think, a prior resolution that said that uh, no uh, city um, resources could Correct. be used by, uh, by ICE, um, including space at the uh, prisoner transport. And uh, to my knowledge, it's, they're still not over there. Right, I, I understand that, but also in a journal article when all of this was kind of really big a few months ago, yeah. um, we heard about and saw copies of Mayor Barry and Chief Eden's letters to, um, to federal ICE people telling them that they were welcome. I think it was kind of them bowing and kowtowing to them to not try to lose federal money. Remember when that was all going on? But they said themselves, and remember we have talked about it, of course, but you know, we got all those answers from them that yes, that they had made the invitation and they re-upped their invitation here not, not too many months ago. So that's what concerns me. That's why I think we need to rescind it publicly and unambiguously so that people know and our community members know that that's happened. So that's my, that's my ask. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCash. Next speaker, Edgar uh, Sal uh, Salinas, followed by Alicia Sines. Welcome. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Edgar Salinas, and uh, I am here to support of a uh, fair basic leave ordinance that will actually support all of uh, Albuquerque workers. There are immediate personal reasons why uh, I support a fair paid uh, sick leave ordinance. But it's not just uh, for myself. I belong to a bigger family, and I'm a proud member of El Centro de Igualdad y Derechos and of its workers' committee. Our membership of over 4,000 is mainly made up of low-income immigrants, workers that work hard every day for their families and to contribute to Albuquerque's uh, economy. I live in Albuquerque, along with my wife and uh, three children. Two of those of my children, they have autism, and they require special treatment. Treatment that it's based on uh, appointments and, uh, you know, different uh, attentions. Uh, and I'm at work, I don't have uh, paid sick leave. Uh, I'm concerned that the ordinance to be introduced tonight, if passes in its current form, will be one of the worst in the country. I understand that it's a starting point, yes, but for it to leave over 90% of Albuquerque workers uh, without benefit, that's just not fair. Um, and uh, I will not be eligible, nor would just uh, about every member of El Centro. 
Workers like me shouldn't have uh, to choose between caring for our loved ones and our jobs. Having children with autism requires me to miss some days of work through the year to attend therapy and other medical appointment. Uh, another thing is that several months ago, my mother had an episode of uh, diabetes and I had to make a decision between uh, going to work and get a full paycheck or uh, taking uh, my mom to, uh, to the hospital. And that was, uh, that was sad. And uh, my story isn't unique. There is a thousands of people here in Albuquerque, workers that are in my position and um, we all deserve to have these uh, basic benefits. That's Thank all. you, Mr. Thank Salinas. you very much. Next speaker, Alicia Sainz. President, may I ask for additional time for translation? You may. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Alicia Sainz. Soy miembro de, del Centro de Igualdad de Derechos. Estoy aquí para eh, pedir apoyo para los trabajadores de Alburquerque. Cuando yo llegué por primera vez a Alburquerque, era madre soltera con cuatro hijos. Aunque tenía el apoyo de mi madre y cuidaba, ella cuidaba de mis hijos cuando se enfermaban. Um, sé que hay miles de madres solteras trabajando sin algún apoyo, alguno. <coughs> Sorry, disculpen. Me preocupa que la propuesta que se va a introducir esta noche no cubra la gran mayoría de ellas. Les pido, creen una política para todos los que trabajan aquí en Alburquerque. Gracias. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Alicia Sainz. I'm a member of Centro de Igualdad y Derechos. I'm here to ask for your support in support a, a, a paid sick leave policy for all Albuquerque workers. When I first came to Albuquerque, I came as a single mother with four children. I did have the support of my mother who would look after my children when they would become ill. Unfortunately, there are thousands of mothers, single mothers, that work without this kind of support. I am concerned that the current proposal that is about to introduce tonight um, just wouldn't cover many of these single mothers. I ask of the council that they create a policy that works for all Albuquerque workers, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, Jeremy Schment, and we've also got Flora Lucero. Go ahead. Yeah. Flora, go ahead. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, President Sanchez and council members. Thank you for having me here tonight. A little more than a year ago, I was an armchair citizen who voted, then sat back on my couch and watched the political process through my television set. On November 8, 2016, I saw the undisputable evidence that our social political system is broken. And after grieving, I got rid of my couch, I rolled up my sleeves, and I got to work. Because as Mahatma Gandhi so famously said, we must be the change we wish to see in the world. Today, I ask you to do the same. We, the citizens of Albuquerque, New Mexico, need you to be the change we wish to see in this world. I am a native of this fair land. The roots of both sides of my family are deep, deep in the soil of this rich and fertile valley. Having lived here my entire life, I have never seen this city in such a desperate state. The sight of homeless, single people, couples and families Filling Coronado Park is heartbreaking. The crushing reality of the drug and mental health crisis we are facing as evidenced daily as we see the desperate people walking our streets and the women 
who could be our daughters, granddaughters, and friends prostituting themselves in broad daylight. We need you to do your part as representatives on the council to work together with the new administration and to move us to a better place. We need you to step outside of your comfort zones and change. We need you to be the change we wish to see in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy Schment, followed by Terry Stroach, followed by Ron R.C. Casaus, followed, followed by the last speak speaker, Ellen Wagman. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. President, Council. Uh, I like that term, uh, a couch Democrat, where you, you elect your leaders and then you send them off and you say, I, I trust you to do the right thing and I'm not going to pay any attention. Now, I, I do have a, a note card with an eyeball on it and I respectfully put that away. However, something has occurred to me that I would like to share with you and that is that we cannot sit down as voters anymore and, and trust that everything's going to work out fine by going to sleep for two years and just going out for five minutes every, every November and voting and going home. So I just want to say that, that um, I'm happy to be out there supporting you all. I am working hard, knocking on doors to get you elected and, and trying my best to understand the policies and to watch the policies because the devil is now in the details. The front is not in the rhetoric. We're not having a battle over, over ideas. We all want security. We all want prosperity. We all want jobs. We all want a crime-free community. That's easy. What's hard is the details. How do we get there? And I feel like we've been gaslit. I feel like we've been given policies that say one thing, but do the other thing, right? We get all the uh, high road and they get all the money, right? We're, 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 we're saying, oh, well, well we get um, you know, justice and they get the water rights. What I'm basically saying is that I'd like you to support a strong agenda that, that aligns with the voters who came out this November. We want increment of one, we want, we oppose Santolina, we want the myth of scarcity, we believe in that. We believe that there are funds that can help us with what we really prioritize and they're not being spent on our priorities. So we wanna see the details, we want to be an open and transparent process, we wanna be more inclusive, or more included in that process. So I thank you for hearing us and, and I look forward to uh, meeting with you more often. Thank you. Terry Stroach? Um, President Sanchez, council members, um, hello, my name is Terry Storch and my remarks are spurred by the paid sick leave ordinance um, to be introduced by um, President uh, Sanchez and Vice President Harris. Um, for any major important ordinance or law that the city council passes, citizen and voter input um, is fundamental and necessary if there's to be successful acceptance of that law. Bringing paid sick leave to Albuquerque's working people who do not have that important job protection is just such an important measure. The importance to Albuquerque of a comprehensive and inclusive earned paid sick leave law was demonstrated by the October vote when virtually half of Albuquerque voters backed just such a comprehensive measure. Uh, Ms. Wagoner, who spoke before me, well contrasted that initiative with the, um, the one that's going to be introduced by President Sanchez and Vice President Harris. And I understand from the Albuquerque Journal article that um, you are welcoming um, discussion of that, that it's not a closed door and a done deal. The council as a whole and individual councilors will best care for the well-being of the city and best represent their constituents if they recognize the need to work together. Bring all stakeholders to the table on the earned paid sick leave ordinance. Slow down the process. Get citizen input. Order studies. Importantly, ask to the table those who um, proposed and launched the initiative on the October ballot. The way Albuquerque does the citizen's business and must do the citizen's business is with open doors and open process and informed deliberation. And it must invite and include people like Mr. Buffin, like Mr. Salinas, like Ms. Salas, who've already addressed the council about their own very real situations. Thank you. Thank you. 
Ron R C Casas. Casillas. You're next. Followed by Ellen Wagner. Where does the time go, right? Can I uh, get you to give one of these to all the city council? Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, good evening, Ennis Casillas, and I appreciate it. First of all, I wanted to thank uh, all of you guys uh, that are on city council, ladies and gentlemen, and you deserve a round of applause, even though it's not uh, protocol for you guys to get that. For congratulations on your re-election. We, uh, the, for those that are re-elected and new on board, Ms. Cynthia, and of course, uh, old school, Lawrence uh, Rael, we <laughs> appreciate you coming back and putting the city back in order, and uh, Tim Keller, our new mayor. Uh, my name is Ron Casillas, and I am the president of the Silver Platinum Downtown Neighborhood Association. The reason I gave you a card is because we finally were able to afford them. We started about two and a half years ago, and we're in central downtown. Our borders are from Cole North to Mountain Road and Broadway, the railroad tracks west to uh, A Street with some jagged borders. And the reason I'm mentioning that is our, our, our uh, website is silverplatinumdowntown.org, and we do things like uh, have the uh, downtown tours and several links on our website, which receives about 1,300 hits a month on our website. So what I wanted to bring to your attention was, first of all, congratulating you and having Chief Geyer uh, as well. But the revitalization of downtown is finally going to happen with this new uh, team to put together. So anything that comes across your guys' board uh, as far as approving things, additional parking, and, and some great things to revitalize downtown finally, I think we got the right team in place now to, to do that. And uh, I just wanted to encourage you to please band together and finally let's get a revitalized downtown Albuquerque. It's about that time. We're about the only city in all the major metropolitan uh, cities in, in the United States that don't have a revitalized downtown or a vibrant downtown. So please pay, uh, pay close attention to any matters that come up and vote for the revitalization of downtown. And also I wanted to point out the, um, the uh, cruising also. I'd like to get on that board too because I was with the uh, Lowrider magazine. I toured with that magazine for six years and I was with the Super Nationals car show and did that for 14 years. So I do have a background on cruising and uh, I would certainly like to see uh, cruising anywhere but downtown, central downtown, and maybe do it on the west side, you know, where, where we have plenty of space to do that. And I'm open for questions, if you guys have any. Please. RC, thank you. All righty, and thank you. Please Last visit the website. <laughs> and it's Casillas. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. Last speaker is Ellen Wegman, under general public comment. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. President, members of council. I didn't come here to speak about these two issues, but I'll mention them. First, the sick leave ordinance needs to call in sick. Second, second, um, the coyote population is not just an animal welfare issue. If it's a public, if it's a public safety issue, killing coyotes increases the coyote population. Leaving them alone stabilizes it. Um, <clears throat> so, if there's concern about them, stop killing them. Last time I was in front of the council. I criticized the audit of the monitor, um, attacking a small part after sitting silent while the last administration stonewalled on police reform. I mentioned in a piece that the council seemed to be not concerned about the money paid to Scott Greenwood and President Sanchez said, oh, but we audited Mr. Greenwood. Yeah, you approved, I can't remember, the figure was either 750000 or a million dollars in no-bid contracts to, for Mr. Greenwood, and you got back from him a fee that a hotel charged because he brought his dog to the room. This is not financial oversight. Now we're learning that the council accepted the, the administration's rosy scenario on gross receipts tax and unrealistic expectations for growth, and we're in a hole because nobody looked at what was behind what the financial projections. Um, we learned that ART doesn't have federal funding. Under this administration, ART might not get it. This is not responsible oversight, and if you're gonna monitor pennies, that's not, that's not responsible oversight. So uh, I'd ask you to look at things more than when millions are flying out the door, monitoring $100 or $200 is not the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that concludes general public comments. We are now under announcements. Uh, Councillor Benton. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be an Albuquerque Bernalillo County Government Commission meeting tomorrow, December 19th at 5 p.m. in the Vincent E. Griego Chambers. 
Councillor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority meeting scheduled for Wednesday, December the 20th has been canceled. Thank you, Councillor Pena. And we are now under uh, public hearings, and this is item A, AC 17-11. Frank Salazar, agent for Cherry Hill Civic Association, appeals the decision of the Environmental Planning Commission. And I will turn this over to Mr. Melendres to please explain. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. This is an appeal of the EPC's approval of a zone map amendment from SU1 for church-related uses to SU1 for a senior facility and related uses and an associated site de development plan for subdivision and building permit. Um, adjacent, the adjacent neighborhood association, the Cherry Hill Civic Association, appealed to the city council and the matter was referred to the land use hearing officer. The land use hearing officer is recommending that this matter be remanded to the Environmental Planning Commission for a rehearing in order to fully comply with minimum procedural requirements and to clarify certain of its findings. Specifically, the land use hearing officer determined that the EPC erred in declining to permit cross-examination during the hearing and that some of the EPC's findings could also uh, use some clarification upon remand. Accordingly, the, EPC, uh, the LUHO recommends that this matter go back to the EPC for rehearing before uh, before any final action could be taken on it at, at this level. This is an accept or reject hearing. You'll be considering whether or not to accept or reject the recommendation and findings of the land use hearing officer. If you have questions, I'll do my best to answer those from the record. If we cannot answer all those tonight, we can have a full hearing on this matter in two weeks. Council Vice President Harris. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Melendrez, we ch chatted a little bit, and it seems that the uh, that the appellant has a point that the EPC might have actually failed to uh, honor a legal requirement. Mr. President, Council Harris, that is correct. I move that we accept the recommendations of the land use hearing officer. We have a motion and a second to accept the uh, decision by the land use hearing officer. Are there any questions? Councilor Jones. I would also like to amend that and add that we accept the recommendations and the findings. And that will include the recommendations and findings? That's a friendly amendment. Any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying yes. Yeah. Yes, opposed? That carries unanimously. Let's go ahead and move on to the next item on the agenda, and that is the uh, confirmation. We were planning to take a dinner break, but we'll go through with the confirmations. Councillor Benton. Uh, Mr. President, uh, on item A, C-17-1, uh, appointment of Sarita Nair uh, to the position of Chief Administrative Officer, I move a uh, be confirmed. Second. We have a motion and about four seconds. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions for Mrs. Nair? Seeing none, all those in favor of the confirmation say yes. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Congratulations. Would you like to make any comments? Council President Sanchez, uh, members of the uh, City Council, just want to thank you for all the time that you've extended to myself and the rest of the executive team over the past couple of weeks and spending time with us, help, helping us to understand the priorities within your district and your priorities legislatively, and we look forward to working together. Thank you. And we are looking forward to working with you. Uh, next item is item B, EC2, appointment of Suna Lee Stewart to the position of Deputy Chief Administrative Officer. I move confirmation. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are there any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the confirmation of Suna Lee Stewart signify by saying yes. 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 Any opposition? No. That carries unanimously. Would you like to make a couple of comments? Mr. Chairman, members of the council, one thing I learned in 15 years of public service is to keep it short when people are hungry. So <laughs> I will keep it short. Uh, thank you. I look forward to working with all of you. And we look forward to working with you. Our next item is item EC3, appointment of Sanjay Bhakta to the position of the Chief Financial Officer. I move confirmation. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Signify by saying yes. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Mr. Bhakta, is he here to make any comments? Welcome. Mr. President and members of the council, I would echo what just Sunala said. We are hungry and we are in the spirit of Christmas, so I'll keep it short. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. We look forward to working with you. Our next item is item D, EC4, the appointment of Lawrence Rael to the position of Chief Operations Officer. I move confirmation. Second. We have a motion and several seconds. 
All those in favor, signify by saying yes. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Welcome, Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. President and members of the council. I think I got a filibuster for a couple hours just because no one else took their time. <laughs> just kidding. Thank you very much. I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you, and we look forward to working with you. Uh, we will be taking a dinner break now. We will return in about 30 minutes.